Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And I'm so glad you're joining us this morning because today on the show, I'd like to welcome Greg Jenkins, diversity and inclusion, let's say that again, diversity and inclusion consultant, Army veteran, mentor, and coach. Greg provides talent development for organizations by delivering D&I expertise, team building and leadership, development and assessment, design, development, implementation, and evaluation of strategy, training content, marketing, facilitation, coaching, I'm losing my breath, and veteran transition mentoring. He is doing a lot. Greg is passionate in assisting individuals and organizations in learning and growing in order to achieve better levels of performance. Greg. Welcome to the show. Hi, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. It, well, it's good to see you again. I feel like it's been forever. It seems that way. Yeah. So one of the first questions that I like to ask, because I think it plays an important part in building your professional you know, career and all that, is how did we get connected? You know, I think it was through a networking process that uh, we we both uh, became part of, and uh, and introductions followed from there. And uh, I think there was a, a, a mutual understanding of, of wanting to meet one another and kind of learn a little bit more about each other and our work. Well, you're close. We did <laughs> meet in a networking event afterwards, but we were originally introduced by Frank Egan. Oh, that's right. My high school buddy. Yeah. And it was so interesting because Frank sent me an email and he's like, man, I haven't talked to this guy in years and he's mm -hmm. just kind of resurfaced back in my life. Is this somebody you think would be good for your podcast? And I'm like, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love everything that you're doing. Well, it's really nice that we got connected and, uh, and yeah, it, it was a blast from the past. No, no question about it. It's been literally decades since I had talked to Frank. That is crazy. Did y'all kind of pick up right where you left off? You know, I think, uh, yeah, I think we did. You know, it was it was kind of like going back to like the high school days and then, you know, what have you been doing since then? And, you know, mm -hmm. family and kids and careers. And so, yeah, it was it was a wonderful trip down memory lane and kind of seeing where we now have ended up at this point in our lives. Interesting. So, um, so Frank founded an organization. I tell mm -hmm. people all the time, all roads lead back to Frank, right? All connections. Pretty because much. It seems like the man knows everybody, mm -hmm. but we actually have a really great um, networking group that we're a part of called the Networking Hub, which I mm -hmm. have met so many great people. I've gotten so many resources. I, I mean, my bucket has been filled through this group. So we're actually meeting tonight. Are you going to be joining us? Uh, this evening, I don't think so. I've got uh, already scheduled activities for this evening. Okay, next Unfortunately. month. Unfortunately. Next month, you'll have to come back because it's a mm -hmm. great, great group. So, all right, well, we're here to talk about you today. So tell me a little bit about yourself and, and it's kind of an interesting story, if I'm remembering correctly, when and mm -hmm. how did you fall into the D&I space, diversity and inclusion? Yeah, that, uh, that is an interesting story because uh, initially I wanted nothing to do with it. And so to give a, your, your listeners a little bit of a backstory, you know, I was serving in the, the United States Army and I was at the uh, about the 20 year mark and I was just coming out of the invasion of Iraq in 04. We'd been there a year, obviously in 03, we, we, that's when that event occurred. And I was at the 20 year mark, as I had said, and I was going to retire and move on to something else in my life. And the Army at the time said, well, no, we'd like you to uh, go through some training and some education about equal opportunity and diversity and inclusion. And I wanted nothing to do with any of that. And the reason that I felt that way at the time was my perception, my understanding of those words, those topics, what I would refer to then as programs, was that they were for women and minorities. And I didn't understand why as an older, white, cisgendered, straight male uh, in a senior leadership position in a 
global organization was going to have to change what I was doing as a combat engineer and go into this into this space. So that's what my perception was then. So I was very resistant to uh, to that idea, but I was a good soldier, and uh, so I I went you know through that process. And once I got in to understanding more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it really, really opened up my eyes to like, wow, there's a great value here. And, um, and it has lit a fire and a passion that's been burning brightly ever since 2005, when I initially went through this, you know, my first uh, program. That is amazing. And isn't it funny how sometimes the things we resist the most are the things that we eventually embrace the most? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's very fascinating how wrong our perceptions can be about certain things and people sometimes. Absolutely, and and so just quickly, can you give us definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion? Just real quick definitions. Well, sure. I mean, diversity. A quick definition just means difference. I mean, it's that, that's about as simple as you can make it. You know, equity. You know, talking about things being equal. Uh, if we're looking for the sim most simplest kinds of definitions, and inclusion just means that that aspect or that that experience of being included, belonging, um, those those are very 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 simple, very basic definitions of those three words. And, and I think it was really good of you to do that because I think a lot of us hear this D E and I, this diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sure. they don't really understand what they're talking about. Just kind of like you said, when you were first, you know, really challenging them that you didn't want to do that, that mm -hmm. they were still, um, you know, still lost my train of thought. There. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? One thing I've really learned to do on this podcast yeah. is sure. go with it. Just yep. if it doesn't work, just go with it. We're just having a conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what are some indicators that a company could benefit from implementing diversity um, and inclusion efforts in their world? You know, I think there's a couple of things that you should look at. Uh, an organization can look at what is going on with their, with their company or their firm internally. Uh, what are the retention rates look like? Uh, leadership development, succession planning. Um, employee satisfaction, you know, levels within the organization. So you could have a whole conversation just around the inside the walls of the organization. And then the other aspect of that would be what's happening externally. Uh, what is it that you provide? You know, what goods and services do you do you produce? What's the what's the market that you sell to look like? Uh, are you uh, engaged in as many parts of that of the overarching marketplace as you would like to be? Uh, are you losing market share to a competitor? Mm -hmm. uh, because there may be some various aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion that you're not paying attention to, and maybe perhaps your competitors are. Um, there's there's a, there's a lot of things that you can look at. I think I think understanding what's going on inside your organization is important, and what is going on outside your organization. Those are two good places to start. Awesome. So a key component of inclusion is empathy. So in your own words, what does empathy mean to you and why is it so important? Well, you know, I think the way, a, a good way to define empathy is, you know, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So I can have sympathy for somebody, not, not empathy, but sympathy for a moment. And I feel pity or remorse or sorrow for something you've gone through, but I may not have ever gone through that myself. But empathy is when I'm, even if I haven't had the same kind of experience you have, I, I can try to put myself in your shoes and have to really get a little deeper, like, well, gee, what is it that Casey may be struggling with that I haven't experienced, but let me try to feel the feelings that she's having to understand her better. And I think with empathy, it gives us an opportunity at least to, to be, I think, more connected to what another person is going through. And by that, greater level or, or deeper level of understanding of those feelings, maybe then I can be more helpful or more understanding uh, or, or something that I can do to perhaps lessen the burden or make things, you know, in a, in a situation potentially better, at least understand it better. Yeah. And then, of course, there's always that other extreme where you've got apathy, right? And to me, that's just, you know, the, the complete opposite of sympathy where you just don't care. Is that... You know. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, apathy, you know, it, it, I, I like to say, you know, when I'm talking to clients or, or um, 
you know, what, what impacts me concerns me. Ooh. So, so if I, if I understand now, if I flip that around, so what impacts my client or my potential client also concerns them. So if I don't understand what impacts them, uh, then I'm not going to understand what also concerns them. So I may find out that if I haven't done any research, or I haven't gotten to know this person or this group of people, that they may be rather apathetic because what I'm talking about really doesn't impact them nor concern them. So, so yeah, I think I think it's my responsibility if I'm trying to help an organization increase performance levels or reduce a pain point is understand what impacts them and thus concerns them, thus eliminates or at least mitigates that apathetic situation that may be occurring. Wow, that was really good. I love that. What impacts me concerns me. Concerns me, me right? And right. then just flip it around. Yeah, no, that is really good. I like that. Um, so you also have another term, and I wanted to ask you this. What does it mean to be in a position of disadvantage? And can you give us some examples? Yeah, and I think the first thing you would we would want to discuss is what is our perception of the disadvantage? Okay. And let me give you a point that we opened up this, this particular podcast with. I thought when I was about to go into the diversity, equity, and inclusion space for the United States Army that I was in a position of disadvantage. Mm -hmm. That was my perception. Once I was introduced formally and started to go through a process of learning and discovery and introspection, it was not a position of disadvantage, but an absolute just blessing of advantage. So I, I think when we're we're taking a look at when what we think is disadvantage, you know, a disadvantage for us, are we sure we are seeing it in in the correct manner? If it is in fact a disadvantage, well, what can we do to reduce that disadvantage, or why is it occurring, or what's the way out of it, or or that kind of a thing. But I think we really got to take a step back sometimes and say, okay, first of all, let me make sure I've assessed the situation more fully. Is this truly a disadvantage for me, or am I missing something bigger and better here? Is there a process that you take people through when you're trying to get them to see if it is truly a position of disadvantage? Well, yeah, because I really kind of want to know what's their perception, because, you know, you and I could look at the same situation or, or occurrence or whatever the case may be, and you can, you and I can see it from from very opposite ends of the same scale. So I think one of the first steps in in you know kind of having that conversation when somebody thinks that they're seeing or experiencing or going to experience a disadvantage is, gee, I sure would like to learn a little bit more about you first before we even get talking about this so-called disadvantage because what you may be perceiving may be something that I'm missing, or maybe there's something more here that I haven't discovered about you first before we even get to the conversation about disadvantage. So I think it's about a relationship, professional relationship building so we can understand each other a little bit better. And then let's tackle this supposed disadvantage. You know, and I don't know if this relates at all, but for some reason, when you were talking, it just immediately brought up one of my clients that I'm working with right now that has the most horrendous interview mm -hmm. process of any client I've ever worked with. I mean, it takes right. weeks to get through this process. And I kept thinking that is a position of disadvantage. And I, and it's a true position of disadvantage, you know, because they're losing candidates because the, the right. candidates are getting offers so quickly right now. Um, right. They have like a 48 hour to 48 to 72 hour shelf life before they get an offer, usually multiple right. offers. And this takes weeks. And I've been trying to coach and, and they're they're dying for help for this position. But I'm like, you're not until the tide turns. If you don't change your interview process, this is going to continue to happen. You're going to continue to lose out on good talent. So would that be a good example of a position of disadvantage? Well, I think it's a good an example of a position of disadvantage, but Casey, I'd like to wonder why they have that process in the first place. It goes back to learning more about that person mm -hmm. or that company or that process, that department, the division, the hiring manager, whoever. So why why do you have this, this long drawn out process that takes such an extended period of time that your competition is coming in and swiping up your 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 potential you know candidates? Yeah. So again, I want to say, let's find out about who this we are talking about and the process they've developed and why 
then let's take a look at that position of disadvantage. You have clearly said that there's a position of disadvantage there. I wonder why they built it that way. That would be my first question, right? And, and I have tried to get to the bottom of this and the best answer I get, maybe you can help me here for a minute, coach me sure. to coach them. Um, the best answer I get is we've been doing it this way for 10 years and the company swears by it. And this is a large publicly traded company. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a very common response that I don't know has a lot of merit in it. It's because it's the way we've always done business. That almost sounds like a going out of business strategy. When you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, things change. I mean, that's the only constant is that things are going to change. And if, and if I am still stuck in the things that I've been using 10 years ago, mm -hmm. thinking that a decades old process is going to get me 10 years into the future, I may be woefully really, really wrong. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. So I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> I do that from time to time. Um, okay. So when it comes to job seeking and interviewing, how can a job seeker tell whether a company lacks diversity? You know, that's a great question. And I know, and I, I keep going back to this, let's define the word first. So when, when I get to ask that question, well, what does diversity mean? And I said, it is difference, but which differences are we talking about? So is it a difference of skin color, of race, of age, of gender? Uh, those are things that can be relatively identified through sight, right? Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things, many, many more aspects or layers of an individual's diversity that we cannot see and understand until we get to know those people a little bit better. So if we're just talking about men and women, white and black and brown and Asian, well, that's pretty easy to see if those people are walking around the company, right? But what about generational differences? What about religious preference differences, LGBTQ sexual orientation differences? Who's married, who's single, who's divorced? Who, who's got what kind of educational backgrounds? Who's been in, traveled the world and who's got perspectives from other, other nations? So, I mean, we can start getting really granular and find out that there can be diversity in a, in a room where people look very, very much alike and, and maybe on the surface, they do look very much alike, but when you start to understand who they are, you find out there is a massive amount of difference in these people. So I think it's important if we're just gonna talk about the visual aspects of diversity, that's pretty easy, look around. You know, what's, what is, what's the organization look like? Um, you know, sometimes we'll look at the brochure or the website of the organization and, and their marketing has done a really great job of making it look like a very appearing diverse organization. Mm -hmm. But then when you get into the organization, it'd be like, wow, this is not what the website looked like. So I, I think a little research is, is, uh, is, is needed there. But again, I want to say, how are you perceiving what that word diversity means to you when you're going into an organization? I, that's a really good distinction, um, and I think that is important, you know, because I, I know for me, I want to know that people have like core values when I'm looking to move to a company, which I hope I never mm -hmm. have to do again. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, right. but I do want to know that those core values align, which if they don't, that could be a diversity issue for me. Absolutely. And I would say, I would also caution, you know, don't, I would, I wouldn't suggest that somebody says, oh, this is a, a group of very different looking people. They must think like me. They must have the same core values. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know this company yet. So, you know, again, our perceptions can be, can be very misleading sometimes. So this looks like a very diverse organization. I'm looking for that, but I think as a job seeker, I, I should probably do a little bit a little bit more research uh, when I'm trying to find out, is this an organization that is gonna live the, the mission, vision and values that I'm interested in? Would it be appropriate during the interview process just to ask if they have a DEI initiative and is it a red flag if they don't? Well, I think it's absolutely appropriate. I mean, that's, that's a good question. And as a matter of fact, you know, in an interview, there should be at least two interviews happening. The organization that is looking for talent is obviously interviewing you. And I think every single job seeker that is in an interview should be interviewing that company. Yes. So there should be two of those interviews going on. And you know what? And I, I would argue that that would help both parties. So if I view myself as a one person corporation and my little corporation has value, and I'm trying to find the best partnering organization, 
that's going to prepare me to know what I'm looking for, what I'm good at, and how can I take those skills and marry them up to the ABC company. And then the ABC company would then not be hiring people who are just looking for a job and then, you know, and then lose me six months later, you know. But but I, I think, yeah, as, as my little one cor person corporation, I want to know you got a diversity program. Is that if that's important to me, I want to ask about that question. There's nothing wrong with that thing. As a matter of fact, that is becoming or growing in terms of its of its favorability in terms of questioning of a job seeker is, hey, I'm going to go into an organization and this is important to me. Tell me about your DNI program, policies, practices. What do you do? You know, those are absolutely on the table. Well, and, and I do, I want to encourage people because, you know, as we come through this pandemic, you know, there's been a lot of self-reflection and a lot of self-awareness. You know, people have had right. time to really reflect and see what is it I truly want. And what I hope you truly want is to find that company that aligns with what you want to do. And so right. many people don't take the time, like you're saying, in that interview process, ask those hard questions and get to, they just, sometimes they just want the job, but I'm yeah. going to encourage people to go out there and find your passion. Yes. And, and find that right company that's going to support that passion. Oh yeah, Casey, absolutely. Uh, and you know, and I get it. I, I understand, you know, when you need to put food on a table and put gas in the car and, and pay the rent and the mortgage, you need a job. So, and a lot of times we'll take the first thing that comes down the road and that may not be the best fit, mm -hmm. not for you and not for the company. And now you both lose six, eight months, a year later when you quit because it just didn't really fit well. So, I mean, this is, I think is a, a much deeper conversation is, is how do you understand what your value proposition is as a job seeker? What's, what is, what's the definition of your one person corporation? Because when you understand that better, you're going to know which companies you want to go after, uh, mm -hmm. what's important to you. Is diversity and inclusion an important aspect for your little one person corporation? Ask the questions, do some research. Is it something to do with uh, whatever it is? Is it energy? Is it healthcare? What, what's that passion? Like you just used that word a moment ago. What's that thing that is in your heart on fire because you're motivated to work there in that space? What is that for you? Uh, maybe it is diversity, equity, and inclusion. For me, it is. Um, and that's me speaking for self. So I know what my little one person corporation wants to do. I want to be associated with organizations where that's valuable to them. <laughs> I think that's amazing. And I just want to be associated with an organization. And I am very fortunate to have found that, that wants to give value first, that wants to yeah. help those around them by mm -hmm. empowering them, but also empowering us to empower the people we come into contact with on a daily basis. You know, yeah, absolutely. You know, I always like to asking the question to a group of people when we're in, if, it, if it's appropriate in the conversation, I'll ask, you know, where can you make money? And the answer is anywhere. Mm -hmm. So if I can make money anywhere, then wouldn't I want to make money in a place where my values and passion align with theirs? I mean, I, that would be the, the intersection where you want to be living and working. Yep. You know, if I can make money anywhere, then it doesn't matter what job I take, but I don't want to just take a job just for the money because I can make money anywhere. So I want to make money where I, I fit, where I, I'm aligned with, with what the organization is trying to do. Uh, man, those are good places to be, to be, mm -hmm. you know, be working in. And they do exist. You just have to oh, take yes, some time and absolutely. look for them. You absolutely do. So, okay. So how can an employee of a company, we've got the job now. Sure. Um, it's not what we thought it was, not the program we thought it was. So, but we don't want to make a move. We haven't been here long enough. So how can an employee of a company work to enhance diversity and inclusion within their organization, even if they're not in a leadership role? You know, the, the, the very, the first thing that comes to mind is focus on what you control. So if, if I am making widgets or I'm processing, you know, paperwork or whatever it is I'm doing, I want to be the best I can at that job. Um, and, and I think, and here, here's the reason I say that, um, Colin Powell, former secretary mm -hmm. of state, uh, in, in one of his books he wrote, and I, I'll re refer to it. He was talking about the first job he ever had. And, and it was in his uncle's or his uncle worked at a bottling plant and they were bottling some kind of drink, right? Soda pop or cola, whatever the case may be. And the uncle said, I'll give you a job at this bottling plant. And Colin was like, I don't want to work in a bottling plant. 
but but it was a job that he needed and he got into that job and then he started to realize like wait a minute i don't want to be a janitor because that's what the position was he goes but i'm going to be the best janitor on the face of the earth and he said it was that mindset of just do the best you can with the job you have right in front of you and if you have that mindset towards whatever it is that you're doing you're going to be more focused on doing a better job and so if you're an individual contributor do the best job that you can if you're in that position and now you have two or eight or 18 or 28 people that are working for you well gee you have control there as well so how are you going to make those people let's just say you have a group of five people that work for you if i want to get those five people to come to work and do their jobs i got to make sure that i'm not i'm not beating them with a stick I want to provide them with opportunity. I want to make sure that they know that they're valued and important, that they're welcome, they're heard, they're respected, and that I need them on this team. What can I do to support you so that you can be more successful? Whether there's a diversity, equity, inclusion policy or not, I really don't care at this point. If this is the job I'm in and I'm going to make it work for myself, then at least I know that my team, I can focus and invest in them. And by focusing and investing in them, they will reciprocate. And I, and I can tell you, I know that that works because in my 28, 28 years, eight months and five days in the United States Army, the best leaders I had did exactly what I just said. They focused on us as team members and we loved working for those people because they cared, there was concern. Uh, they, there was, you know, are you doing okay? Uh, how, how is, how's your family doing? Do you have the tools and resources necessary to do your job? If there's something that I can do for you, let me know what it is. That's a good place to be working. Absolutely. And I love what you said by being the best at your job, where you're at right now. And I heard a speaker last night, as a matter of fact, and he was talking about when crap starts rolling downhill, he goes, mm -hmm. open up your crap umbrella and circle up your people around you, no matter what level you are, right? And that way, right. as you do start rising up, as long as you keep that protection over those around mm -hmm. you and you keep doing mm -hmm. a good job, they're going to remember that and they're going to support you and it's going to create an awesome culture. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with more, with that more. Uh, I, I really think, you know, the way we treat people is going to be reflected back by those same very people. Mm hmm you know, if you, if you treat and abuse or ignore your team, they're going to abuse and ignore you back. I mean, it's it's kind of, it's very reciprocal. So, you know, if if I'm going to invest in you, I, I'm going to get a re investment back from you. There's going to be return on that. Now, are there going to be some people that just aren't going to get it sometimes? That's going to happen. That, you know, there's a term for that in the HR world. It's called Deadwood, right? <laughs> and sometimes, you know, there's, there's a percentage of your organization that must turn over. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, the better, the more inclusive, the, the more healthy, the more productive the team is, more of the people on that team are going to respond in like kind. I could not agree with you more. I, you know, again, I know I keep going back to VIP, but I'm just, I'm so fortunate to work for such an amazing company. And, right. you know, we're, we're a sales team. And I don't know if you've worked with sales teams in the past, but they can be kind of mean to each other, right? <laughs> and we don't have that on our sales team. We're very mm -hmm. inclusive. We're very team oriented and it makes all the difference in the world. Well, you know, uh, without having experienced any working with you directly, I would have to say that it's probably a reflection of the leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, there's a, even though I was in the army, I am the son of a sailor. So my father was in the Navy and there was a saying he used to use, he says, so is the captain, so goes the ship. Mm, yep. And so, you know, if you're, you know, there's 5,000 people on an aircraft carrier and there's one captain, but that one captain, how, how he or she, uh, how they lead, you know, how they, how they live the values, that trickles all the way down to all those 5,000 people within that big metal box floating around in the ocean. So when I hear things like you've just shared, Casey, I'm, I'm always, that always makes me smile because in my experience, when I hear that kind of feed, unsolicited feedback from an individual, it makes me think like, wow, they must have a leader there that is taking care of that team and 
those team members appreciate it, reciprocate it, mm -hmm. and then promote it publicly like you just did. So <laughs> well done, VIP. <laughs> they do a pretty good job. Okay, I, I need to completely change the subject from d sure, for sure, just sure. a second because you do something <laughs> that is so unusual and so mm -hmm. gracious that I just want to get this out here. So you offer a LinkedIn profile review for free. So I do. why? And what does this include? Yep. You know, I got, I got to tell you the, 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 the why, the story behind it. So I, I retired from the United States Army in 2012. And so by 2010, 2011, I was preparing for that eventual transition. And I, I know somebody told me, get a LinkedIn profile going. And, and I said, okay, I'll do that. And I, and I kind of fumbled around with it. And I made a very weak, very thin, very ineffective profile. And I didn't really know much more about it. And I just kind of left it alone. And then here I was almost retired in 12 and here is this person that I've never met and I still have not met this man and and uh, he had been former military and he reached out and somehow we connected on LinkedIn and once that connection was made he said you know if you did these seven or eight things to your profile you're going to have a dramatic increase in the performance of your LinkedIn profile and so I'm like okay I'll do it I didn't know and I did those things that he recommended. And there was about a 400% increase in connection requests. I'm like overnight, literally wow. overnight. That's not a metaphor. It was like the next day I had a stack of, of people that were trying to connect with me. And I was so amazed by that. It made me start to, to you know, really study LinkedIn a lot better, a lot more closely. And that seven or eight little bullet points that this man has shared with me has now expanded into about 20. And, and so, what I want to do is because that person's help helped me as I was getting ready to retire. Because of that man helping me out, I never had to look for a job coming out of the military. Because if your profile is is as robust as it can be, it's going to work for you while you're sleeping. Yep. So recruiters, as I'm sure you're well aware, use LinkedIn extensively to find talent. So if you know what your one person corporation is about and you know what you want to be known for and searched for and that is communicated in, a, in an effective way on your LinkedIn profile, the talent seekers will come find you. So understanding that better now, what I do for folks, and this started with other military members transitioning because a lot of times military people don't understand what they're going to have to do to prepare themselves for civilian life. I started to do this this LinkedIn profile review for them. That has expanded now to anybody and everybody. It is free, always free. Did I mention it was free? <laughs> so uh, it's it's something. It's I, it's my little piece of pay it forward that I that I like to provide. I just wrote two of them today for for two people not in the military that that asked for some. Now I got people just random folks that just reach out to me and say, Hey, I heard you do these LinkedIn profile reviews. Can I get one? And um, and I and I promise them to anybody and everybody. Matter of fact, and I promise them to your audience right now. So link connect with me and i know i'm I, I might be opening the floodgates and that can be a little dangerous but, <laughs> but uh but i i may not get it done in a day uh if there was a bunch but i i do offer them they are free and and they have helped people tremendously just that one component in terms of their marketing in terms of their job seeking uh, efforts and people seeking them for what they provide in terms of value proposition absolutely and you know regardless of whether you're a job seeker or not right everyone should be networking and there this is a great way to network i have in fact that's how i met frank agan was on linkedin because right. of my linkedin profile and so i everybody needs to make sure their linkedin is optimized we've done many episodes on this but yep. i think you're the first one that said they would do it for free so definitely oh, yeah. want to get that Always out free. there so. Well, you know, in case real quick, it's just not only not only job seekers, not only networking, but also people business. Mm -hmm. Your LinkedIn profile can be your online storefront. So let's clean up that store. There you go. Sweep that front porch. <laughs> okay. Well, we are almost out of time, but I do want to get to our VIP questions because these give me so much insights to, into my guests. Um, yep. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you bring with you? You know, I loved it when the when you know these questions and, and I, I agree they make you think about things. So the first one I, I went with things, right? Okay. So the first thing would be photos of friends and family. I want to bring those with me. 
The second thing is uh, a book that I have, I continue to read for decades now, and it's entitled The Tao of Leadership by John Hyder. And the third thing, and I'm assuming that I'd be able to do this, I'd take my running shoes. Okay. <laughs> Those are the three things. <laughs> got to stay in shape. There you go. And you're going to have to email me the name of that book and author. If you've read it for Absolutely. decades, then I probably want to read it. I Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I will do that. Awesome. All right. So what is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? Hit the gym. First thing, huh? Well, it'll be very close to the first thing, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a morning activity. Yes. Good for but, you. Uh, yep. Every day. I mean, it's, I'll probably do six out of seven days and then depending on the schedule, but yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a That's big a believer lot. in, uh, in, in staying healthy. And, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, about to run a triathlon cause I'm not, but a little bit of working out and running goes a long, long way. If you just do it regularly. Absolutely. Although I wouldn't know, <laughs> but I've heard that I've heard that helps. <laughs> All right. So my final question for you is if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? I would really like it to be that Greg worked hard to be a better person for the people in his life. I bet they would say that you do work hard to be a better person. How do people find you? They can find me obviously on LinkedIn because we've been talking about that for the last 10 minutes. So LinkedIn for sure. I, I'm on that platform every day. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me at gregjenkinsconsulting.com. Uh, any of those three uh, would be would be a place where you could contact me. Uh, doesn't matter where you are. And uh, you can call, text, or email. You can send a carrier pigeon with your contact information. I may not respond. Uh, I pick up the phone immediately, but I will respond. That is so awesome. Thank you for being so available and just for, you know, I love that you have, you call it pay it forward. I call it give back, you know, um, whatever. It's just a very humble heart and a compassionate heart. So I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us here today. Thank you, Casey. I'm so glad and honored to be on your show. Well, I have one more thing to say to you. Sure. You are a VIP. <laughs> Thank you. You're a VIP as well. <laughs> and that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.